thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Really, really appreciate my first ever Buddhist Geeks conference. Wonderful to be here. Um, I started listening to the Buddhist Geeks podcast uh, a little while ago, maybe two or three years ago, at a period when I had insomnia. So um, I don't know. It says something about the podcast, which is it's, a, it's very relaxing. And it gets your mind working at the same time enough to get it off of whatever you're worried about and help you go to sleep. And so after doing this for uh, several months in a row, um, I wrote Vince and uh, talked about maybe potentially coming here. And it was cool to see the people behind the podcast. And it's, it's great for me to be here. Um, I titled the talk Books, uh, Buddhist Geeks of Action. Um, I am perhaps not a Buddhist geek. I think sometimes I'm Buddhist, and I think most of the time I'm a geek. I barely, almost never am the same thing at the same time. So uh, maybe you guys can help me throughout the weekend uh, wrestle with those two things. I have uh, sometimes struggle with the, the dichotomy between you know, being quiet, reflective, uh, relaxed, working on my practice, and also getting a lot done, traveling, and uh, you know, being a person of action. Um, so hopefully you allude to that in several ways throughout the talk, and then just talk about my work, my personal story behind the work, and some ideas for the future based on this work that maybe you can apply to your work. Uh, real quick, this is a picture of me in Cambodia. I was here at a village bank outside of Cambodia. How, how many of you guys know what a village bank is? Okay, great. Some of you. Well, um, village banks exist across the world. There are groups of people that get together and share money. So people put money in a pot, and they simply rotate the money around throughout the group. And there's several different schemes, several different forms of this. But what's amazing is most of the time, uh, in, in such a setup like this, people pay back each other at enormously high rates, almost virtually 100% of the time. And usually people like this are illiterate. So when I, was, when I was there, we were going through an accounting training, working through our past books, le learning how to do basic you know, ledger-based accounting. People that uh, don't have any financial background all the time pay each other back all across the world. It's an incredible phenomenon. I discovered it several years ago um, when I was traveling in Africa, and I've just been dedicating myself to working uh, in this kind of work ever since. And I am not in the village bank, but in this picture, I am in the picture. Um, real quick, uh, I run a website called kiva.org, which is a person-to-person -person lending website. People lend to other people all across the world for the purpose of poverty alleviation. We started it in Africa, and since then it's spread to about 65 countries. We have tons of lenders, about a million lenders, and we have tons of borrowers, about a million borrowers. Um, people are lending to people. Oftentimes, the borrowers are unbanked, so you can't send them the money directly. So we work with NGOs all across the world who source the loans and distribute the loans to people like those people in the village bank in Cambodia. Um, sometimes we lend money directly to people as well onto their cell phones or their PayPal accounts in certain countries where electronic payment systems exist. Uh, they don't exist everywhere right now, but they're certainly spreading. So eventually, this whole thing will become you know, an online digital community of people lending to people both locally and globally to help them. And we're at a very early stage right now in doing this because the world is quite, not quite ready for that idea as a whole. Um, we have lending teams, meaning people getting together in groups, deciding to lend together. We have a religious category. Um, probably none of you uh, are on this team. I'm on this team. The Buddhists rank six in all the religions. So we're doing quite well, um, but we can do better. And we're, we're right behind uh, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. So we, uh, it's a powerful religion. Uh, maybe some of you can be, Buddhism's quite open, so we can be a member of this team as well. Uh, there's probably a lot of similarities between the two religions. Uh, but yeah, this is the all-time uh, biggest, most powerful religion on, uh, on Kiva today. <laughs> But I, I just uh, showed you this to illustrate a little bit about how we work. Uh, some of the foundational principles of Kiva. I started Kiva in 2005 after I saw this man speak, Professor Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who is a Nobel laureate. He started a Grameen Bank, the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, which is a women's cooperative of, uh, you know, 
groups of women who bank together and deposit money in this central bank and uh, take it out. And all the women are the shareholders. The women are often uh, very poor and very illiterate, but they, uh, they pay back virtually all the time at low interest rates. Dr. Yunus started this in Bangladesh in the 70s. No one said it would work. He proved that it would work. And that movement has spread all over the world, whether through Grameen Bank or through other banks like that in almost every country right now. Um, he said something really interesting. I saw him speak to an audience sort of smaller than this at Stanford University. I went to Stanford University. He said something like, capitalism doesn't fully capture the full essence of what it means to be human. Uh, capitalism certainly incentivizes and captures our uh, desire to be greedy, to protect ourselves, to gain security, uh, but it doesn't really capture that side of ourselves that wants to reach out to others, that, or that side that wants to be generous. Um, it doesn't really incentivize that, and there's no trace of that in the capitalist system in general. And he was talking about creating a worldwide system which uh, captures that other side of our humanity, and I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, I went on a long journey with uh, my co-founder uh, to learn more about microfinance, uh, which is the movement he started and started working in Africa in 2003, just you know for a period of time. I was a programmer at TiVo, and uh, for a few years I had been helping people pause live TV. <laughs> that, that was our mission. Um, <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny. Uh, <laughs> Awkward, um, <laughs> awkward for me. <laughs> Lots of friends there. Um, but uh, one day I got a promotion, my first ever promotion out of college, and they gave me a business card. And uh, they, they said, you know, on the back of the business card, you're supposed to write your favorite shows, because that's the little, that's the thing we have in common is this desire, yeah, you know, talking about our favorite shows. And I, I didn't have a TV at the time, <laughs> so I had no favorite shows. So. I think my card might be the only one in TiVo history without any favorite shows. Um, I don't know how I got on that topic. Um, <laughs> but I went here, uh, took time off from my job, went here, and uh, just worked for a small uh, uh, microfinance institution out in the eastern part of Uganda and was documenting people's stories. So I was a videographer as well as working at TiVo, and so I was interviewing these people, uh, like a pharmacist or a guy that works at a bike tire shop or a clothing reseller, and I was interviewing these people, and I was asking them how the loan affected their life and uh, the impact it had on them and uh, you know, what kind of suffering they were going through. And I noticed I was trying to emphasize sort of how hard their life was before this loan and how good it was after the loan. But people don't really uh, want to talk about themselves as victims. And I noticed that at, in making a documentary for a nonprofit, I was trying to frame people as being victims of, somehow, of some poverty or some oppressive regime or society, uh, which they weren't really volunteering. So I thought that was interesting. And that's sort of one of the biggest lessons I've learned and applied to my work is people universally don't see themselves as victims. And they see themselves as hopeful. They want to focus on their dreams and strategies. And uh, for some reason, we have the need here in North America to uh, portray them that way. And somehow that services us in some interesting way. So maybe it serves our needs to think of other people across the world as in that way. Uh, so I'm interested in that conversation, changing the conversation, working with it a bit, not completely uh, opposing it, but working within the frame of that conversation and uh, helping tweak people's points of views little by little by just having them know each other and connect and experience the awkwardness of that uh, interaction uh, over time. And, uh, experience other people as hopeful agents of change, uh, not necessarily victims that you can save. Um, and uh, I, you know, through conversations like this, I met you know, single mothers, business people. This woman operates a store. It looks often, you know, very similar to stores in my neighborhood in San Francisco. Um, it's not that different. She's you know, in a society that doesn't have a huge safety net, so she's struggling to send her kids to school. She has to make decisions whether to buy medicine or send them to school or get food on the table. Tough, definitely tough society, definitely a lot of struggles, but not a hopeless person and uh, not doing so bad. But there's an extraordinary lack of opportunity. And by the way, we have $25, $50 we can, we can lend to this person who could definitely pay you back. They always pay you back. And you could really you know, affect her trajectory in a good way and experience that progress with her. So uh, I used to sponsor children as a, uh, you know, a child myself. 
And I wanted to take that sponsoring a children dynamic and translate it to a more mature adult dynamic and uh, see what happened. So um, I fe- this is our first borrower. Uh, I went home, uh, got my job back at TiVo, programmed uh, all night for like a year, programmed this person-to-person website where people could lend to other people internationally and put this woman on this uh, site. She is a fish seller, so she sells three or four fish on the side of the street. And if we were able to give her a $500 loan, you can imagine she could sell many fish because she could buy a freezer, put the fish in the freezer, um, you know, have some uh, benefits of scale. I don't know what the word is. And um, you know, increase her profit margin. So ideas like that are simple, but really hard to achieve in a place with no financial markets. Um, so we put her on the website, and my dad and my co-founder's dad funded her on the, the day we launched in 2005, and she was able to get a $500 loan to buy that freezer, to buy fish in bulk from fishermen, not from a middleman, and take that, that trip to the lake. Um, so we just dedicated ourselves to repeating stories like this over and over and over ever since, and it's just been six years. It's been an amazing journey. Um, We started working in other places, so we started partnering with NGOs in other places outside of Africa. So this is a woman in Kenya who got a loan to buy a goat. In this case, it was a hybrid goat, which is like a more efficient goat, maybe. Um, (laughs) And she, you know, women in Africa were sort of the thing for like a year plus, and they're very popular. They fund very fast on the site, and so we expanded all through East Africa. Then... um, there was a war. There was a war in Afghanistan, so we started working in Afghanistan. And in Muslim societies, uh, you know, women don't show up in photos, and so there was. We started lending to a lot of men in Muslim societies, and that worked out really well because our lenders were drawn to places of political unrest where they think they can help. And so it was really interesting. Um, we 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 had uh, it, we've had interesting dynamics of uh, people uploading pictures of cats and lending to people, and the, the, the borrowers see that, and we have to explain why this is. Um, and the borrowers universally ask, why do I have to repay that cat or that sunset? Um, so I didn't mean just to come up here and tell jokes all the time. Um, I went through a, a really hard period uh, about f- after three years of doing this of just total burnout. I en- encountered a lot of fraud and difficult situations personally and professionally across the world. I was totally burnt out. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever been there. Just when you, you can't, can't sleep enough, your battery is like in deep discharge. There's nothing you can do to get energy back. Um, so everyone I know that started meditating, at least in the States, has a story. You, oh, you meditate? What happened to you? <laughs> Uh, so that's my uh, born again meditation story, um, but I don't think it, in other cultures it's that way. But often in San Francisco and beyond, you know, the states, people that meditate had some sort of difficult situation. So for me, that was the same. I discovered Jack Cornfield, great author. He was here last year, uh, so that's a picture of him at the Buddhist Geeks conference. But he said something that's really affected my work about compassion. And compassion and pity are very different. Whereas compassion reflects the yearning of the heart to merge and to take on some of the suffering, pity is a controlled set of thoughts designed to assure separateness. Compassion is the spontaneous response of love, pity the involuntary reflex of fear. And so um, I, I reflect on this a lot, trying to foster and cultivate that dynamic of compassion, connectedness between people, where you want to help somebody because you realize there's a sense of a part of yourself and that person, and that person, in fact, is one with you, and I don't need to portray you as a victim that I can save to make myself feel better, but actually I realize that in helping you, I'm helping myself, because we're really not that separate after all. And so that dynamic uh, is really the driving force behind my life and my work right now, and I'm just trying to get better and better with those connections uh, so that people can see this for themselves. At the Zen Center in San Francisco, we have this idea of the bodhisattva vow, uh, the idea that um, I vow to save all living beings, which is a quite stressful vow. (laughs) So here I was burnt out, and then I'm thinking Zen is going to, you know, solve all these problems, go to the Zen Center, and I learn now I'm signing up to save all living beings, which I was trying to do before, and it totally (laughs) exhausted me. 
But I'll end on that note. This is about halfway through the presentation, but it's a good place to stop because I have to go, but because um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be forced off the stage. Um, but uh, there's something about realizing that, yes, we are trying to save all living beings, but actually there's no separation between me and those living beings. So the more we meditate, the more we practice, the more we realize that truth the less stressful it is because we realize that those living beings are just ourself. And in the practice of saving ourselves, we are doing that. In the practice of saving those living beings, we are saving ourselves. Those two things are one and the same, uh, which is a really refreshing and freeing thing to think. Thank you.